Hi, hello, bonjour, and namaste. This is Out of the Clouds, a podcast at the crossroads between business and mindfulness. And I'm your host, Anne Muletala. So today this interview is particularly meaningful to me because it gave me the opportunity to catch up with a friend I haven't seen since before the pandemic. So today my guest is Jennifer Fisher. Jennifer is a talented and very successful jewelry designer based in New York City. The reach of her brand is international and she's been worn by countless absolutely incredible women from all walks of life. It felt very special to have this conversation and for me to delve and ask her questions I would not ask her over the course of normal conversation. Of course, we talk about jewelry, how she came to build the first piece that launched her brand and the importance of talismans. She tells me, well, how she allows herself to learn from things that don't work, how cultivating a positive mindset and finding something to be hopeful towards daily and how trusting her gut are some of the ways that have helped her not just build a business, but build a life and support her throughout difficult times. We also talk in depth about the importance of making smarter food choices, which you'll see is something that's particularly important to both of us. We touch on the exciting launch of her new fragrance, and she tells me about the wonderful partnership she has at home and at work with her husband, Kevin. I find myself endlessly inspired by Jennifer, so I'm excited to be bringing you this conversation. And I hope that you'll feel the same way as you get to know Jen throughout this interview. So thanks for being here and happy listening. So let's do this. Hey, Jennifer, welcome to Out of the Clouds. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, I'm one of my favorite people in the world, Anne. How are you? Thanks for having me. I got so excited when I was, you know, writing up the questions before before our interview because I realized how much I missed you and how proud of you I was. And and I felt all bubbly and happy inside. <laughs> I miss you so much too. You're one of those people in my life that I miss all the time. And then once we're reconnected again, it's like no time has gone by. It's like exactly the same. Yeah, it's absolutely. Fun. It's so good. Not a lot of friends like that. So tell me, where am I finding you today? So you are finding me today in New York City. My name, for those who don't know, is Jennifer Fisher. I am a jewelry designer, now foraying into lifestyle and food and cooking and other design things. <laughs> <laughs> As I grow and get older, things are morphing. And I am at my home in New York City right now. And can I ask you, what is this incredibly beautiful piece of art behind you? So this is, and who do you think that is? First of all, can you I guess who it is? You're never going to guess. So this was taken by my friend, Luke Guilford, who's an amazing director and photographer. And that's actually Pamela Anderson. (gasps) Oh, wow. Yeah. It's really powerful. If you can really look, her eyes are watering. She's about to cry. It's really a powerful piece. And it's actually every time I do something and people are like, that's kind of intimidating to have behind (laughs) you in the middle of a movie. Oh, no, I find her beautiful. Isn't it pretty? Oh, it's gorgeous. For a second, I was wondering if it was you. Some people have said that, but yeah, no, it's it's her dressed up and it's not, I'm not like a massive Pamela Anderson fan. I just think it's a powerful photo. Very, for sure. I've collected photography my whole life. Mm, yeah. So before we get into that and much more, I'd love for you to tell your story uh, for our listeners. And I like to keep it quite open. Uh, just tell people who you are, what you do and and where you came from. So I got into jewelry. I actually, uh, my studies in school, I will talk about Switzerland later. I was in Switzerland a little bit in high school, which really formed who I am. And then I ended up coming back, finishing high school in Santa Barbara, California. I grew up in Montecito, which is a small town just south of Santa Barbara. And I ended up going to USC, University of Southern California. And I studied business marketing with a fine art minor. I wish I used that more. And I thought I wanted to be a magazine publisher. And after interning at some magazines and I'd watch the clothing racks go by, 
I realized that I was on the wrong side of the magazine. <laughs> I much rather would be on the other side with the clothing and the fashion. And I was one of those kids who always grew up loving fashion. And fortunately, my mother supported that habit of mine and got me subscriptions to Vogue when I was little. And I would plaster my wall with covers and inspiration, things like that. So I ended up randomly becoming a wardrobe stylist and working in LA and Hollywood. I worked in television for Aaron Spelling. I did commercials for years. I did a little celebrity styling, although that was my least favorite part of being a stylist, to be honest. I really loved the commercial and advertising world, but I think it also has to do with because it's what I studied in school. But I always loved chatting with all the ad people. So when I was, let's see, I was 27 years old and I met this guy named Kevin on a trip to New York. And I was actually dating someone else at the time. And when we broke up, Kevin and I got back together in New York for a date. And that was it. I met my man, Kevin, and we dated. There's a, there's a, an end of the story. We dated for years. <laughs> That's okay. Coast- Keep going. I love it. Three years by coastally. And I was still styling. And while we were dating, I got sick. I got diagnosed with something called a desmoid tumor in my chest, on my chest wall, I should say. It's not cancer. It's a soft tissue sarcoma that's very rare that comes from scar tissue. And they believe it's from uh, scar tissue from my breast implants, but we can talk about that later. That really has nothing to do with what we're talking about, but there you go. Anyways, went through chemotherapy for it and the tumor shrunk and we got married right after when we wanted to have kids. The oncologist said, no, you need to get a surrogate or adopt because we don't want you carrying a, a baby with your tumor. We tried all of that. None of that worked. And then I finally got pregnant naturally. And that was my son, Shane. So when Shane was born, I was still a stylist. People were giving me gifts to represent him. And I didn't like any of them. I thought none of them represented my personal style or who I was as a person. I wanted something heavy and I wanted a big gold chain. And I wanted to wear something that felt like my talisman and my piece that I had made for my son. So I went out and sourced it and I had it made. And I started wearing it on set when I was a stylist. And literally like the grips, the gaffers, everybody was asking me, like, it was an instant conversation piece and everyone wanted to know what it said and what it was. And then once they knew about it, they wanted to buy one for their significant other. And so I literally started making jewelry for people on set when I was a stylist. And at one point I was making so much that my husband looked at me and he was like, John, I think this is a business. Maybe maybe we should do this or you should do this. And I luckily made a piece for Uma Thurman and it was delivered to her the day that she shot the cover of Glamour magazine and she wore it on the cover of Glamour. And that's sort of like the story of my business, how it started. You know, I started selling direct to consumer fine jewelry online long before a lot of people were really doing anything like that. You know, and that it just grew that way. It grew, you know, people were started like naturally asking for other shapes or, you know, different things. We started doing different gold colors, different chains, and it literally just grew organically from listening to what my customers were asking for and just sort of doing what I wanted and hoping that people liked it. That is awesome. I remember the first time we met, you telling me the story of the the tumor and the wanting to have that talisman, something that you could sort of, yeah, carry with you. And and it's interesting because that really has stayed with me ever since then. I wasn't particularly a massive fan of jewelry growing up. I mean, I like shiny things, but, you know, but I do really relate to that sense of keepsake. Right. And also perhaps growing up with time, this sense that when something's precious, you're going to keep it, look after it. And there's the preciousness of the talisman, but also of the, of the material, right? That can also be recognized and passed on. Exactly. That other things would not necessarily be seen as precious and, and passed on the same way. Exactly. I think there's something about when you're able to personalize a piece that you can wear of fine jewelry like that, that it's not just something that you've purchased that everybody else is going to have the same, you know, whatever design that, you know, is on it. And you walk around and you see someone, and you're like, oh, that's the necklace I have. It's the same, whatever. I think there's something to be said for making the choice to, to customize it on your own and to do like my lock that I'm wearing today has my four, has JKSD on it. But you know, no one else is going to do JKSD. <laughs> you know, people are going to do whatever they want on it. And so it's yours alone. And it's, it's something that you have, you've chosen to make for yourself to protect you and to sort of keep with you. And it's, it makes me feel grounded and protected every day when I wear it. Mm. Really, I do. Yeah. It's true. Jewelry is really powerful. Yeah. I want to tell you that just after the, 
just after we started the lockdown, I was in my studio apartment in Geneva. I'd wanted to buy a chain from you to build my own necklace. And, <laughs> and you should explain to people how to do that because that's a whole thing. And it's interesting because maybe a month or six weeks into it, it was an immediate thing that I knew that I needed. I needed to have something to make me feel better. And I got in touch and I ordered it. And I also got an ankle chain. And so I built my... I built my little custom little yeah. bundle of joy. Yeah. And it's and it's it's fascinating that this was something that I decided to invest into in a time that I was really dark where I shouldn't have been spending money, but where I needed to be reminded of certain things and carry these keepsakes. So it's I had no idea at the time that we'd be talking about this on a podcast two years later, by the way. <laughs> Although it was in the mix, you know, I was already building it up, but, but it's not something that I could see through. But how cool is that, that you now have that talisman of your own, that you were able to put your other things on, you know, that means something to you. So you've created your own personal necklace, bracelet, charm, anklet, whatever it is. That's what's so cool is that you can add your own things to it and you can grow it over time with my stuff or things that have been passed down to you already. You know, that was part of the reason why I wanted to do these loose charm necklaces is that at the time I was, you know, I collected charms my whole life. My mother made me a sterling silver charm bracelet with every place they'd ever go. They'd get me something wherever they went. And I have this massive charm bracelet that's so heavy you can't wear it, but it's just really more decor. It's really beautiful. But I remember I wanted to make a necklace out of some of them. And I remember going to certain places and everyone's like, you don't do that. You don't put charms on a necklace like that. You, you put them onto a bracelet and you separate them. Like people, there was like rules to how to do it. And I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to create our own rules. <laughs> we're going to put them loose on a chain and we're going to put whatever you want on it. That's what we're going to do. So it's nice that you, you know, that resonated with you too. You wanted the same one. Mm, but I do think that it's a bit magic and it just, yeah, it, it feels very special to me. That makes me Before happy. I go back to some questions, because I, I want to go back in time to talk about teenage and uni, Jennifer. There's something that in, intrigues me about what you said about your story. All of the guys that were on set working with you wanted this. Are you making jewelry for men as well? And how we is are, that? We do. Yes, we make charm necklaces for men all the time. That's amazing. Yeah. How did that develop? This jewelry is for anybody. It doesn't matter what sex you associate with or whatever you are. You know, it's we have this for everybody. The males love uh, dog tags. So we mm -hmm. do a lot of dog tags for men. We do a lot, a lot of white gold for men. Mm -hmm. You know, so we offer white, rose, and yellow gold. I want to make sure that we can make something for everybody. It's just a matter of figuring out what your choice is of what shape resonates with you as a person. And men, I don't know mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's a old school military vibe thing. I don't know if what, what the reasoning is. Um, but that's really the shape that a lot of them resonate towards. It's interesting because uh, last year there was a, a close friend of mine had a chain that was passed down from his family and he was kind of obsessively looking for something and couldn't find anything right for a really long time. And, and I don't think I remembered that you were doing men or did I? I'm not sure. It's for anybody, honestly. Charms are cool. Charms can go on anybody. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and, and I do think it looks really wonderful as well on guys. Yeah, and men love wearing personalized things, especially with their children. We do key rings now. We do so many different things. Awesome. So now let's go back for a second because I love doing my research, even when I'm interviewing friends. I know this and... is so impressive. <laughs> well, I'm I mean, impressed. it's so thoughtful. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I was thinking of you when I was doing it. So one thing that I saw in one of the interviews that I caught is that you were voted in high school, the girl most likely to go to Paris for dinner. Can you please tell me that story? Oh God, I was. I think I was that girl in high school that no one could really figure out. Like my fashion was always wacky. I was always like shopping vintage, trying to take a jacket and change it and make it my own. Like I'd go to Melrose and I'd go down there and I remember I bought this really cool like red velvet jacket that had this crest and on it. And I added all these different buttons and things to make it my own. So I was sort of always that girl that was like, this is not exactly right. I'm going to change it. I'm going to wear it. And I'd wear it to school and people were like, like crazy, wacky fashion sense. Like I was never, you know, I wasn't the most popular girl in high school. I wasn't the sporty girl in high school. I just was that girl that was sort of unique. I think people respected me for it. I did go to boarding school in Switzerland for my junior year, which I really think shaped who I am today. Wow. Um, Can you tell me that story? Yeah, sure. I, I had a girlfriend that went to TASIS, which is the American school in Montagnola in Lugano. And it just, it sounded magical and amazing. And I ended up 
going for a year. I was like, you know what? I'm out of here. Like Santa Barbara's boring. Like, I got to go do something. <laughs> you know, I'm not surfing. I'm not, you know, I just, I always knew I was that girl that was going to leave the smaller beachy town. And I really always thought that I would end up in New York city to be quite honest. Um, because I just was not that small beachy town girl. And so, you know, my first chance that I, that I could get out, I was out. And so I went and it was the most amazing experience ever. You know, I, I, I was terrified. I remember crying on a suitcase out front of a Mexican restaurant that my parents took me to. We were on our way to the airport to go to LAX. And I was like, I don't know if I should do this. Oh my God, what am I doing? Like alone. And it was one of those things that you have to, I think, take a chance in life to be independent and to do something different in order to really figure out who you are. That that shaped me in a way of having to sort of just live on my own, fend for myself. Granted, I was at a boarding school in Switzerland. It wasn't like it was rough living. It was amazing. But, you know, having to go and make all new friends and you're, I was thrown into a house. We lived in the attic of one of these small houses that were around the school. And I was with five different girls from five different countries. And, you know, you just got to make it work. So when you have opportunities to do something different like that, you should take them. Yeah. And distance does really help separate us from the parents and help us grow. Personally, I know that my life really took on a completely different meaning and my relationship as well with my parents changed for the better after I moved to London. Right. But I was so funny is I was one of those kids when I was really, I don't think I've ever said this before on anything, but I was really connected. Like I would, I was one of those kids that like didn't want to go to school some days when I was little because I didn't want to like leave my mom. Like I was one of those kids. Mm. And what's so funny is that I grew up to be the exact opposite of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I need to call my mom, you know? So it's, it's interesting how you kind of turn out mm. um, and how things change. So yeah. And I need to tell you, do you remember there was a TV show called Santa Barbara? Of course I remember Santa Barbara. Oh my God. It's the first TV show I ever got into. And it was, what's her name? Robin, Robin Wright Penn. Yes. Was p- playing the, the lead role. And I was How obsessed. Was so I was in Switzerland obsessed by, by Santa Barbara. I can when you get out. Santa Barbara and you came to Switzerland. It's just very yeah. Funny. Yeah. But, you know, and another lesson too, I think I should have stayed longer. We got to go to Prague when it was still like, I mean, the things that I got to do while I was there, you know, but then I get, then again, I made the choice to come home for spring break instead of going to Kenya, or I didn't stay for my senior year because I wanted to go to prom, you know, so I made certain choices that I think now being older, I should have stayed, but it was an amazing year out of my life and it really shaped who I am today. Mm, that's wonderful. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. So I also understand that your love of jewelry making and your entrepreneurial spirit sort of st- came early to you. What's the earliest memory you have of, of connecting with jewelry or business? Well, it was probably business first. I was always sort of a hustler. You know, I was that kid that my parents, my father loved to gamble and was in Vegas a lot when I was a kid. It was a high roller. And so my parents would go to Vegas a lot on the weekends and I'd be left with babysitters. And I would always be like, I'm bored. Let's do something. Let's start a business. So <laughs> I think every time they'd go on these trips for like three days, I would start a business. I mean, I literally was the kid that would cut the flowers out of your yard, go back, make bouquets, and then go knock on your door and be like, hi, would you like to buy a bouquet of flowers? But I've done everything. I had a button earring company. I started with one of them. I had a splatter paint clothing business. A friend of mine, um, we would take avocados from trees in our, because, you know, Santa Barbara is all avocados and lemons. Um, And we would go on the side of the road and sell avocados. So much so that one day this guy who owned one of the bigger Mexican restaurants was like, I'll take them all and give them to me every week because... Yes, they were a great deal. So oh my we were, God, that's you know, amazing. We were hustling. You know, I think there were those of us that weren't, if we weren't into like the surfing beach scene, we were kind of like, okay, what are we going to do? We, oh, unless get, you're getting in trouble, you're like starting a business. So I kind of did that to keep it, but I was young. But to be honest, my first memory, I mean, I made the button earrings and I had this Caterpillar hair clip company. I literally would like sold them in a clothing store. Like by the time my parents got back in town, I think I'd like hustled and convinced them to sell them. But I, my grandfather was a polo player up in Santa Barbara. So, and sort of a a very well-known one. And he also was a silversmith in his like time off. And he would make bolo ties and belt buckles and things for his friends. I mean, he was like, he was the guy who like 
would teach like Tommy Lee Jones and Sylvester Stallone and those guys how to play polo. He was like an old school cowboy. So much so my, my father actually grew up in Montecito also. My father always made sure that my grandfather had a nice space to do his work. And, you know, he would come over a lot before dinner. And it was a lot, a lot of the times like in our garage. So like I have memories of being out sitting on the washer and dryer in the garage, you know, or wherever. And he was out there in his workbench and he was making you know, bolo ties or belt buckles for, the, for you know, his friends. And so I would just sit there and we would chat and I'd watch him do it. And I'd ask him questions and keep him company. He's always wearing his cowboy hat while he did it, which is so crazy. So that was my first memory of it. And what's so funny is I sort of forgot about all of that because he was, he was such a polo player and this was sort of like his hobby, but it never really registered with me. Even after I started my company and I started doing interviews and people were talking to me about my, you know, where is my affinity for jewelry come from? And I was like, I honestly never really wore jewelry growing up. I collected watches, which was so strange as I got older and I was never really one to accessorize. And then finally, one day it came to me. I was like, oh, it's my grandfather. And his wow. soul work. Yeah, that's wonderful. What a story. Mm. He was always customizing with monograms and letters and things like that and to customize and personalize all these things for those people. And I never really, it was the exact same thing, but different. Mm. Wow. Mm. It's wonderful the ways in which we get inspired and it's almost like it planted a seed and it took 20, 30 years for you to even realize that the growth was coming from, from those days. I know. Isn't that wild? And I'd love to see a picture of him, by the way. He sounds quite He's fabulous. so cool. I will show you a picture of Grandpa Dean. He's I mean, so a grandfather that wears a, a cowboy hat. He's so cowboy handsome hat. too. Shane kind of looks like, he lo sort of looks like my dad, but then Shane also kind of looks like him too. It's sort of interesting, but mm. more Irish looking. <laughs> I'll, I'll, you'll, I'll, I'll show you a photo of him. It's amazing. Yes, please. So I'd love for you to tell me a little bit about how after you, you started building your company, did you ever imagine that it would grow to the size that it has. How did you imagine your business journey when you got started? I mean, I'm, I've always been a very ambitious person, just naturally. And I, I never really, you know, and what's so funny is we have these talks all the time because it's like your five-year plan, your 10-year plan is we're so much bigger now. You know, where do you see yourself here? And I'm, I was like, ah, ah, bigger, you know, I, it, it's, but I never, I never like to define exactly what that is or what that means. Because I, if five years ago, if I had said that I would be in the food and lifestyle world the way that I am now, I would have never imagined that. I was positive in my way of thinking daily about where things are going. And, and I always know that if something doesn't work out, something else is going to. So I sort of live my daily life that way, that, okay, it's going to grow and it's going to become something amazing. I don't know exactly what that's going to be because things are fluid and things change. And I think it's so funny. And I think that's such an old way of thinking about things when people are like, so tell us what you want to be in five years. What? <laughs> yeah, that is such you know, a good point. It's so true. I feel like it's so outdated. I think as certain businesses grow, I mean, yes, you have to have a plan, but I do think it's interesting that, you know, you can't say that, you know, you're going to be exactly this because you're not going to be, you never mm. are. Yeah. You can, you can be hopeful daily that things are going to go in that direction, which I think is part of how my business has grown. And the reason that it has grown so much is that I don't allow myself to ever be defeated ever. Mm. You know, I, I allow myself to learn from things that don't work mm. and to easily try to sort of change directions and be just easily be able to just sort of, okay, that's not working. Let's go, let's go and try this. Mm. Or let's, you know, that sounds interesting. Why don't we give that a shot? And I think being trying to be a little more open-minded about things and opportunities that come your way and also trusting your gut, which is like, it's such a, it's such a cliche, but it's so true. You know, if something doesn't feel right, it's normally isn't, you know, that mm. kind of thing. Yeah. There's Thanks something you just said that I find super interesting. What I'm hearing you say is that the way you relate to failure is different than for most people. Because a lot of people, when they fail, they just think, oh, that's not going to work. And they kind of shut down or move away. And the other day I saw a really interesting interview, excuse me, not interview. It was a talk at Stanford by Carol Dweck, who wrote the book about growth mindset. And And I'd love to hear you tell me, where do you think that mindset of yours to, to accept and, and move on or pivot came from? I think it's something that's in you. I think that you have to, you know, my whole life I've been like this. I can't remember a time that I haven't been like this. I think my parents did help me with that a lot by forcing me to be independent early 
and not forcing me, but giving me the opportunity to be. And I think it's more about every day I wake up and I, I know that it's not going to be a perfect day and that's okay. But there's going to be a lot of amazing things that are going to happen that day. They're going to put you in a direction that's going to be positive. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to live every day with this positive mindset that, it, okay, there's going to be things that don't work out, but that also means there's going to be other things that are going to work out. So you can't be rigid in your thinking that everything has to work the way that you, exactly the way that you imagined it, because that's just not, life, not how life goes. Hmm. I, it's just sort of an innate positivity. Like I think that you have to live with daily that some days are going to be horribly stressful and really, really hard. But from those days come other things. You know what you sound like? You sound very balanced. The, the image that comes to me right now is that in order for you to be able to see the positive when there is negative is you need to be able to balance. You know, I'm thinking of a tipping point and you know that things are going to be like this, but you also understand that it's not always going to be negative. It's right. kind of wonderful. Thanks for that. You're welcome. But I think you have, more people have to think that way. And we try to raise our kids that way too, to think that way, because it's so important because it can be so detrimental to people professionally, personally, everything, everyday lives, having a negative mindset about things, especially in this day and age. It's so important to try to remain positive about things. Life is stressful. And especially growing a business is really stressful. I mean, no one understands the amount of stress that I am under every day. It's it's extraordinary. And it's, I was talking to Nina, my publicist about it yesterday about how stressed out I am. There's a lot going on and there's a lot of moving parts, but in those moving parts, there's things that are really exciting and positive. So you have to try to balance in your brain, you know, okay, there's this, it's really stressful. And Kevin's working on that. And there's <laughs> this, it's really stressful. And Nina's working on that. There's, there's things that I'm working on that sort of have to do with all of those things, but then I have to keep myself together and balanced and continuing the forward momentum of what I'm doing in order to keep all of this going. So yeah. you can't, you can't just crawl under the table and take a nap. It well, <laughs> doesn't work I get that it. way. If you want to get stuff done, if you want to build your life and build all of this stuff, you just, it's just not even a choice that I have. I tend to be honest, if I had that choice, I still think I wouldn't do it. There's something that there's an excitement in the unknown of the stress of all of it also, which is sounds kind of strange. Mm, just- no, not really. Because um, I found out over the course of my studies that actually stress and excitement have the same root. So I think that depending on whether you're seeing things as positive or negative, then this is really two sides of the same coin, essentially. Right. You can be excited or you can be very stressed out. And sometimes it's one or the other. I do both. And I think that's why I'm like, ah. So that- <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is life. I wouldn't want it any other way. I wouldn't mm. want it any other way. So when I was considering the ways in which I, I saw part of the growth of your business and yours as well as an entrepreneur and as a, as a designer, I saw that social media and Instagram in particular was you know, a huge part of how you communicated. And as you mentioned at the beginning of our chat together, so you do have a business background. This is something that you studied and clearly you were a born entrepreneur, <laughs> but you also did want for a while work in publishing. So I think that you have these three different skill sets. And I wonder if you think that's what powered your capacity to actually throw yourself into social media the way that you did. I think the social media thing, listen, I was an early adapter to Instagram. It was just one of those things that I felt it was an amazing communication tool. That's all Instagram is. It's a communication tool. It's nothing else. I, I, don't, I don't credit Instagram to my business whatsoever. But I do think that it's an amazing way to communicate with your customers. I, I actually, I need to evolve more into Instagram, which is interesting. You know, everyone's like, you need to do more videos. You need to do more reels. And now it's like TikTok and all this other stuff that you have to do. I think there's a level of, of maybe it's just confidence of just, you know, going on there early. And I was like, throw it up there and let's see what happens. That's how my salt business started was through Instagram because I, I put up yeah. my, everyone was posting their avocado toast every day. Like it was so annoying. And it was, every photo was like your version of avocado toast. <laughs> well, I did it too. Shocking. And so I put up on my jewelry page, I put up my avocado toast. And I had sprinkled some of my salt that I kept on the side of my stove onto my avocado toast. And 
I literally got more questions about what was on that avocado toast than like what (laughs) Juliana was wearing in like the photo before. They were like, what's on your eggs? What is that? That's well, first crazy. it was like, how do you poach, how do you poach an egg? And then the say it was also like, and what is that salt that's on there? What are those, what is, what is that? What are those herbs? So that's, I don't know. Instagram's, Instagram's an interesting place to, to roll around in, but I run all the social, I run all the social media on my own still. I do all the content and I do all the posting. Which I think is really wonderful because the one thing that I know from developing and running the Christian Louboutin Instagram is that people feel connection. They understand, even if they don't analyze it, we can feel when something's authentic and we can feel when it's fabricated. And generally great results come from that sense of direct trust and connection with, with whoever's posting. Right. I want to ask you more questions about business, but now I want to talk about salt. I have to ask you, so come on, what is the salt? Tell us all about it. So the salt started, so my mom and dad always send me boxes of lemons and avocados. Like, it's so funny. I get this like box. That's so Californian of you. That's crazy. (laughs) But it's so cool because I'm always like, yes, I never like to waste things. So I always use my lemons or I would, I would take the rind off. I would grate the rind off of my lemon and dry it and use it in recipes and things like that. And then I'd use the rest of the lemon. So I have Hashimoto's. I have thyroid disease. So I have always been conscious of food, not always, but since I've got diagnosed with it, which, you know, about, you know, 30 years ago, I've had this, I've lived with this and I've always sort of been, oh my God, what do I do? No, no, no Western doctor could tell me what to do with food or how to eat or what to do. And I was like, always just trying to figure out on my own, but I did know the gluten was bad for you. So I've been off gluten for a very long time as per my endocrinologist. And I I now intermittent fast, but at the time when I started my salt, I was eating breakfast and I love to eat eggs because I don't eat a ton of protein. So I'd always make eggs in the morning and I couldn't find anything out there. I would go to the stores. I'd go to all these specialty markets and I would go and try to find something to put on my eggs in the morning that would be flavorful, that would have everything that I wanted in it, but nothing was right. Everything was like a rub for meat or it was like potpourri. And like, I'm not, I'm not putting rosemary on my eggs. Like it just wasn't what I wanted. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make my own. Kind of like the jewelry. I'm like, I can't find what I want. I'm going to make my own. So I made this little bowl of salt and had all the things that I loved in it. Cilantro, dill, uh, crushed red chili pepper flakes, my dad's lemon rind, you know, Australian natural sea salt, all these like, black pepper, all the things that I wanted with no garlic and onion. And I would sprinkle that on everything. And the egg thing happened on Instagram and I was putting it on all of my food. And Kevin was like, Jen, this is really good. I'm like, oh. And then one day, Nina, my, my publicist was like, let's give that as a holiday gift to all the editors. And I was like, great idea. So we did it as a holiday gifting to all the EICs and everybody that works in fashion. Cause normally they're getting like, you know, a chocolate bar with like a designer's logo or their face on it or something like nothing that's going to be useful to them when they're working late hours, you know, and tired and hungry at their desk. So we're like, let's send them a little kit. So we sent everyone sort of like an avocado mash kit that was natural. We got so many thank you notes from like editors and chiefs, which like, you know, that never happens. So they were like, thank you so much for sending something so thoughtful and delicious. And oh my gosh, can we buy this salt? And I was like, okay, giddy up, here we go. So we started (laughs) packaging the salt. So universal was the first flavor. And then we did the spicy flavor, which is the second flavor. And then I did a Japanese curry flavor. So we've got three flavors currently of the salts. They come in a smaller uh, container and they also come in like a refill bag. So you can refill those glass because con- they're really beautiful beauty containers. I wanted the containers to look gorgeous and feel nice. And you want to keep them on your counter. You don't want to hide them like a regular plastic jar. So we have the refills. And then we now have, which is so exciting, we have little travel packs, like stick packs, coming because people are literally carrying around my jars of salt in their bags and they're heavy. (laughs) So we're going to give little, you know, people can take them to go because people are taking them to restaurants to use. So hopefully, you know, I'd love to get into, you know, having them on airplanes and in restaurants and all over the place. Oh, that is such a good idea. Airplanes. Oh, you need to partner with an airline. Yes, we do. Yeah. Great idea. I was, I was on JetBlue on my way to LA and I was like, I was looking, they have all these like cool little specialty things. I was like, my salt needs to be in here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, actually right now it needs to be in my kitchen because I haven't tried it and it sounds delicious, but. How have you not tried it? Nina, we'll make sure you got some. Because so. I haven't been in New York since you've launched and we're technically it, I guess. Not supposed, we're technically not supposed to send it to Europe yet. But. Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm aware of these kind of on it. difficulties. There's yeah. so many things. It's so hard. And now, so it's like, we figured out how to build a jewelry brand. Not, you know, now we're figuring out how to run, how to do a food, a, a CPG food business. Mm. And poor Kevin, my husband is running all of it. We're all f- just figuring it out as we go. Mm. So it's uh, interesting. Yeah, it is. And I can see from your Instagram earlier today that the recipes that you're building, it's again, it's, it feels very thoughtful. And now I understand your story with food a little bit more. Are we expecting a cookbook? A well, that's what show? Why I wanted to work in publishing. Maybe that's what it is. So we're trying to figure out what, what we're going to do. Because right now the recipes live on my website. There's a kitchen tab on my mm-hmm. website. You can buy the salt there. You can go and look at the recipes. So we're trying to figure out, because for me, I don't use cookbooks. And I, I think that they, a lot of people don't, a lot of people do. I'm trying to figure out how to make everybody happy. Is it some sort of a really beautiful curated book binder situation that you can choose your recipes that you want in there? Is it a subscription? We're working out what it should be. Mm, it's interesting. We're yeah. right now. We're trying to figure out what the right solution is for, but there's definitely, that's definitely happening. We just have to figure out exactly what form it is. A mm-hmm. book might be the easiest thing to do, mm-hmm. um, but I think it could be kind of cool to do something more. Maybe it's an app where you can go and subscribe and then you download your pages every month that you want or every week. I mean, I spit out so many recipes right now. Every day I go on the Jennifer Fisher kitchen and I cook live what I'm making for dinner every day. And then there's, there's another recipe. So there's one to two recipes normally every day. I think we're going to start shooting it and owning more of the content off of Instagram also, which I'd like to do. So we'll do that too. Yeah. I was going to tell you, so what I find we've done, a lot of us who like cooking, especially in the last couple of years, is that I've definitely bought a few new cookbooks, but because I like seasonal product, is that I will buy product and then I'll just go what the hell do I want to do with this? Me and then, too. <laughs> Me too. And then I will Google my favorite chef and it's, oh, that's Oto- it's your time. Your yeah. So basically I love Otolenghi. And so what I do is I literally go Otolenghi zucchini and I just look at what comes up. <laughs> now well, I still I buy his cookbooks it. and that's I still use it. them. But how many recipes do you really use out of one cookbook? Do you think? Are you Maybe not But that doesn't mean to say that I don't really relish and like the discovery. Because holding it and like the vision, like the smell or the visual of it. What do you like? Because that's what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that they really love the idea of actually holding it. I like reading it. I like reading the cookbook. And also I'm going to adapt some things because like you, I have a food situation. So for those listeners who don't know, I have been diagnosed back in 2014 with rheumatoid arthritis and I played with my diet. And so I am gluten-free, dairy-free and meat-free and right now more or less disease-free. So not needing to use any medication, which is still available to me if I need it. That's amazing. And so that means that there's 25% or 30% of recipes in any cookbook that's going to be meat. So that's already gone, but I can adapt it. Right. Here's one thing for you to consider some of the recipes I wouldn't have tried if I'd not found them on YouTube because they were vegetables that were maybe a little bit funky or something something that in writing I didn't love the sound of. Mm -hmm. And then when you get the context of why someone has built the recipe that they did, you wouldn't necessarily read that in the book. But suddenly it made me feel really that I needed to learn how to make this Bahraini rice prawn dish. Oh my God, I'm going to be, I'm going to be very hungry when you finish this. I know. <laughs> I know I'm already hungry. But that's funny. So I'll find my seat. I'm like you. So I, I actually, well, first of all, I stopped shopping for the week. Like I used to do, cause I was wasting so much food. Cause I was like, I don't want to eat that now. I'll shop for like one to two days. And sometimes I'll just stop on my way home and get everything that I need, knowing that I keep what I need in the pantry. Like you know, my kelp noodles, my curries, all my things that I know, my coconut milks that I have on hand. So I can just pick up, like you said, whatever seasonal or whatever sounds delicious and then adapt that. But what I'll do, I will, I'll either see something on Instagram that I'm inspired by that I'm like, I can't eat that. That is not for me because that has gluten and dairy and everything in it that I can't have. I'm going to adapt that to what I want to do. And then I'll Google whatever, if there's like a, a vegetable, like I bought oyster mushrooms the other day because I wanted to do something with oyster mushrooms because I remember seeing back, I don't know, it was a while ago. I'm actually going to probably make them for lunch. I remember seeing a while ago, someone doing something really cool with a fried oyster mushroom. 
So I'm like, let me try to do that in a natural way with almond flour or something like on a salad. So I, and then I bought frise. And then I looked online, like how to actually properly cook the oyster mushroom because the stems are tough and things like that. So I'll kind of go back that way and figure out, like educate myself the proper way to cook that vegetable instead of by using it like a, a fully formed recipe from a chef. So I'll just sort of like on the fly, do what I feel like doing based off of that one ingredient. It's funny. So the two of us have got this in common that you have limitations to your diet. And instead of taking what's in the shops, we've both decided to figure it out on our own because I make my own almond and almond and hazelnut milk every Mm -hmm. three days because I'm a big coffee lover and I need something that's really good and it's homemade. And that's just the only way it is. I have an unseasonable amount of different kind of uh, flowers. So I can just try to make anything when the recipe calls for flour and gluten, I just switch it. You're just like me and everyone. Yeah. And it's embarrassing actually, the amount of stuff that's in, in, in my pantry. I'd love to know where did that, where did that come from? Where did you find this motivation? So what's interesting is that you just use the word limitation. I don't think it's limitation. I think it's choice. We finally educated ourselves on what is right for our bodies. So that's what I think so many people out there don't understand. Like I'll, I'll get messages and people are like, oh, you know, this, what diet are you on or what is it? And it's not a diet. It's me making conscious choices because I've educated myself about what not to put into my body. And I, I'm not... I'm not limiting anything. Like I'm just making smarter choices. Like I've made a choice not to eat anything with any gums or shelf stabilizers or oils that I feel are not good for my body. More people have to talk about it about because we've got different health issues. It's these choices that we've educated ourselves on that we now implement. And it's not about being restrictive or because people are like, oh, it's so restrictive. I'm like, no, it's not. I eat like pasta every day. They might just be kelp noodles or cassava noodles, but there is no restriction or limitation to the way that I eat now. And I don't like to even say the word diet. I just say the way that I eat um, now, because we've, you know, we've, we've just learned over time how to, how to, how to do it correctly. And the, mm. I mean, your inflammation is gone. You're off of your medication because you are now making the right choices for your body. Yeah. Like, look at you you're off your meds. Amazing. Yeah. I never got meds. I just, I was let loose after I went to the doctor. You know, my dad was a doctor. My half brother is a doctor. So I think that by osmosis, I am. (laughs) I sort of followed my, I followed my gut instinct after watching a silly TV show. And I thought it was something else. And that got me to take meat off of my diet. And that's where everything sort of changed. Um, I misspoke. I didn't mean limitations, but what I want to put out there for anyone who's listening to us is that I read an amazing book called A Beautiful Constraint, which had been put on the, on the curriculum by Seth Godin when I did one of his courses a few years ago. And it's amazing how creative and resourceful we become when there are constraints put around us. And I think that I've been more creative as with the way that I eat now and the way that I cook than in, in the way that I did in the past, which was much more traditional. Very. I read a book called Ketotarian by Dr. Will Cole. And that's what changed my life for me. I was eating traditionally, traditionally gluten-free um, and not dairy-free and not really meat-free until I read his book and it changed my life. It was weird. It was, I don't know if this was, if it was for you when you got your diagnosis with your arthritis from your doctor, but for me, it was more of just like, I think it was just the time of my life. I was almost 50 and I just was not feeling good. Like I felt my head horrible brain fog. I felt inflamed. It was always just like, I was just like puffy all the time. I could not figure out what was wrong with me. And I read this book and I'm like, this is everything that I need to do that I'm not doing. And I tried it and it literally like, it was instantaneous. Like the brain fog, like my energy shot up, my brain fog went away. You do lose weight because it's, you're losing, you're losing inflammation, swelling in your body, but it's not, it wasn't like the way that you feel when you eat this way. And I think that's, what's so hard for people to kind of understand to sort of start making those smarter choices for your body. I mean, I'm sure you get a lot of judgment from people from the way that you eat. I don't, I don't really talk about it because people just always freak out. I know it's, and it's complicated to go to someone's house for dinner. So I tend to like bring my own a little bit. (laughs) 
I just try to talk about it and be like, you know, I'm not going to, and they, they all know I'm that girl. Oh, Jen's not going to eat that. Okay. <laughs> you can and feel like shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to it now. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, that I do love um, going to Italian restaurants because I know I can always negotiate the menu, which is not true about all types of, you know, food. Yeah. Um, but I'll finish by um, saying this. I find it super inspiring and I can't wait to put my hands on that book. I'm going to get that into my... I want to know after you read it. I'm so curious what you're going to say because I follow it loosely. He's the reason that I intermittent fast in the mornings too. I try to, mm. but I technically don't do it because I have my coffee with my almond milk. So I'm technically not entirely fasting, but I do feel better now that I don't start eating until later in the day. Same um, here. Much more yeah. energized. Much more mm. energized. And, yeah, I, and it's sad because I do love breakfast, so... I agree with you on the avo toast with eggs and stuff as well. Right. <laughs> okay, let's stop because I'm going to try to eat my microphone in a second. So going back to the business piece, one of the things that I loved discovering with you, so I, I, I knew charms, but I didn't know how great charm necklaces were until I met you. And then I discovered women's obsession with hoops, which I think is going to be very important for you to talk everyone through because women are going crazy for your hoops. Please explain. (laughs) I think that the hoop thing, because we all know I did not invent the hoop. They've been around for centuries. I think that what we did was we manipulated a design of them to where they are almost weightless. They feel very light on your ear and it took us a long time to do that. I think it was a matter of putting the product out there, which is a beautiful product. I'm very proud of our, you know, our hoop collection and what we do because they look real. No one would know that they're not real gold. We are very careful in the way that we choose our gold colors, the way that we uh, design and manufacture everything. They're all made in the United States, by the way, too, in New York City and plated in uh, Rhode Island. But I think it was timing. I think it was people were ready for... Hoops are timeless. Hoops have been around since, I mean, forever. And they've come and gone. I always say hoops are sort of like denim. So it's sort of like they go in and out, but there's always a style of it that you need to be wearing at the time. So when we realized that we hit on a uh, style that worked and it was balanced on your ear, we decided, I was like, you know what, I'm going to make every size, shape, color, texture of hoop that I can just blanket the market, you know, basically like a hoop encyclopedia. Yeah. Because hoops can be worn any time of day, day to night, and anybody can wear them. You know, it really like you can, my daughter started wearing them when she was 12 years old. We've got women in their eighties wearing them. It's, they're pretty awesome. It's one of those pieces of jewelry, like a charm necklace that anybody can wear any age. And it's not something that you're going to put on and it's like a giant green stone or something. And you're going to wear to a party or you're going to wear out and then everyone's going to know you know, you're going to put it on the next day. Oh, you're wearing the exact same earrings. Hoops are sort of those things like no one really notices if you're exactly wearing the same pair of denim two days in a row or you're wearing the hoop, same hoop earrings two days in a row. Sort of one of those things that seamlessly goes with everything in your wardrobe and are evergreen throughout the entire year. Like everybody needs hoops at all times. It's a fact. Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, so many amazing women have worn your jewelry and in particular the hoops, I have to say. I mean, when I look at your Instagram and when I look at the, the number of incredible women from all ages and ethnicities, um, all different types of artists and politicians. And I mean, did you ever think cool. it was going to be that good? <laughs> You know, it's one of those things. So so for me, the hoop thing, what makes me really happy is when we see, well, first of all, when I see women walking down the street, that makes me the most happy. When I see someone that I'm like, I know those are my earrings, like, or I know that's my charm necklace. Like that to me still, that never gets old. That will never get old. That makes me so happy. But then when you see someone like JLo going to like wherever, not being styled by her stylist, but just going to the gym and she's wearing my earrings, like that's cool. She made a choice to wear my jewelry instead of being told to wear my jewelry by someone who's paying her to look good. So she knows mm-hmm. she's going to look good in my jewelry. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's one of those things where I think it's like, hoops give you confidence. They make you feel put together. And I say the same thing about my charm necklaces. You can put them on and you throw them on over whatever you're wearing that day and you feel put together. Those simple forms of jewelry that feel timeless are those things that you're going to want to put on every day to feel good. So, you know, celebrities are great, but honestly, like celebrities don't sell jewelry. 
The product mm-hmm. sells itself and word of mouth of people talking about the jewelry. Cause right. You know, the unfortunate thing is that everybody's they're paid to wear jewelry on the red carpets. A lot of celebrities have contracts where they can't wear jewelry because they're signed with someone. So yeah. that whole thing is kind of over. I think what's more important is that they're either choosing it to wear it in their off time or, you know, real women are talking about my hoops that they have to have them because they're comfortable and they feel good in them. Like that's the best thing in the world. For sure. I think as a friend, I'm excited every time I see someone that I love wearing your stuff. (laughs) So my question really comes from a place of excitement. Because they have a lot of choices. They can wear whatever they want and they get sent so much stuff and they're styled in so many things. And it's really cool when someone chooses to wear your stuff. It's a great feeling. Mm, It really is wonderful. Now, you've also been nominated twice as Accessories Designer of the Year at the CFDA Awards. And you've received a lot of amazing accolades. So, I mean, what's the most meaningful to you? And perhaps you can tell me why. Uh, Can I be honest? Yeah. None of it anymore. That stuff to me is industry stuff. And I, I am honored to be a part of all of that. And I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to have those nominations. Mm. But you know, the stuff that really drives me daily is not that stuff anymore. It used to be when I was younger and it was more of an ego thing. Now what drives me and what I feel most proud of is that we have built this company to the point of where it is without outside funding. It's just us. And that's very rare to be able to do. Very rare. So all of those things are amazing. And I am so proud and honored that I've been Uh, nominated for those things. But the industry has changed so much that I think it's really more about focusing on what can we do as a brand to outdo all of that stuff, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) That's awesome. You know, all that stuff is really cool and it's amazing, but it's, you know, you've worked in the business. Mm, Yeah. It's, I find that it's a business that is compelling. And I feel like I've met people who work harder than anyone else in any other industry that I've come across, which I think is something outsiders don't see or know about or understand. So I have tremendous respect, but it's also very codified and it's quite old fashioned despite all appearances of the contrary and, and a bit stiff actually. And all that stuff is like one night and it's great and it's amazing, but it also gives you stresses that take you away from growing your actual business. Mm. So, Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I'm glad that you've gone to talk about this because it was something that I wanted to, to speak to you about as well. In the Katie Couric interview that you did with um, for Skims, which mm-hmm. I really, really enjoyed. That was a fun interview. That was a really fun She's interview. Cute. She's really fun. <laughs> Oh, she, the two of you are great. I loved um, that bit where you were at Union Square uh, <laughs> Market yeah, as well. So I think it's in that interview that you, did, you gave business advice and you did say, do it without partners. Can you please tell me a little bit more about this? Because I have my own feelings and, and thoughts on that too, but well, I'd love to hear yours. You know, things have also changed since then. That interview was three years ago. You know, things have changed. You know, my business is growing at a scale now where we do have to consider partners. So like I said, it's one of those funny things where you say, where are you going to be in five years? What are you going to do? You know, we don't know. You know, at the time, you know, I didn't want partners. Now I'm more schooled in things and we're at a level where we're getting much larger, where partners are a great idea for strategic planning and growth. We need to build a board of people. We need to work on growing our C-suite internally. So, you know, that's changed. But I think in the beginning, if you can do it as long as you can, we still don't have uh, outside funding or partners, but it is something that we're considering. And I do think you should do it as long as you can on your own, like bootstrap it yourself and grow it. So you're not having to report to others. I'm not looking forward to that part of it (laughs) as much, (laughs) but you know, but I think the things that will come with it are going to, you know, I've been so independent for so long that I'm Mm. sort of ready for the it's time. Yeah. The upward trajectory. It's time. <laughs> Mom is tired. <laughs> That's I'm ready for some growth. It's time. Yeah. It's time. You know, you talk to so many different people and so many people, different people have different ideas of what your company should be. So it's quite interesting when you start um, speaking to people outside of your bubble. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
Now, um, switching things uh, back, I think because I just mentioned the market of Union Square, which I used to love going to. So despite being a native Santa Barbarian, how do we say this? (laughs) Barbarian. (laughs) I feel like you are now a true New Yorker and I saw that come through in the various interviews that I read and of course New York did hurt a lot in the last few years especially with the pandemic and I know that a lot of people have made comments about leaving the city etc etc and I was wondering how how you feel about New York now Oh, I love New York. New York is amazing. I mean, I, and if you knew what I had to do, Kevin and I, during the pandemic to keep my business going, it made me love the city even more because we did not leave. We were sort of yeah. those ones. I, I always joke about, you know, cause I was literally the person that was going in every day. Cause suddenly what happened with our business during the pandemic, the first week was sort of terrifying because I think no one knew what to do. And then suddenly, boom, everybody was on zoom and Google meet. And all you were seeing was this. Oh. And suddenly our hoop business and our shorter charm necklace business skyrocketed. So we had to figure out how to keep everything going with everybody working remotely. So I had to be the one that would go in every day and ship all of the orders alone in the flat iron where there was no one around. I, I always, I always joke. Do you remember that, that Will Smith um, movie? I am legend where he lived alone in that Brown. Oh, yeah. off, of, off of Washington, Washington square. square. Yeah. Washington square. And so he'd go outside and the zombies were outside. Like that's what it felt like, but it made me love the city so much more because we lived through, I mean, I still, I thought about it last night. Like it's insane that we lived through a pandemic in New York city and did not leave. Mm. with our kids. It's so wild. But what's also so amazing is how resilient New York City is. And also during the pandemic, we did construction and opened a retail store in Beverly Hills, which is also totally insane. But, you know, LA is still sort of different compared to New York. I mean, the cities are completely different, but New York is so resilient and it's really come back. Like already, it's not entirely back, but it's pretty back. I mean, I went to a party you know, this last weekend at, at a bar and it was hot and crowded and dark and packed. And I didn't feel funny. And I don't think anyone there felt, you know, COVID-y. It's, mm. it's, it's interesting how New Yorkers are New Yorkers. We are like tough birds. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah but the city's amazing. Congrats on, on keeping things going the way you did, because that's, that's intense. It was scary. We had Kevin set up the system, you know, and kudos to Kevin. Kevin figured out how to get all of the parts and everything to all of our employees' homes and all of our employees. We didn't furlough one person during the the pandemic. We kept all of our employees. And he figured out the system of getting everything, you know, to each person's home and them doing their work. And then it would be picked up or it'd be shipped. It's kind of amazing. (laughs) Yeah. That's intense. So that's perfect because I wanted to ask you about Kevin. That's great. Thank you for that smooth transition. So you met Kevin in your mid-20s? In my late 20s, I met Kevin. We met Uh through a mutual friend, my best friend, Natasha. They were like family, you know, cousins growing up. And we met, it's so interesting because our first drink was actually at Windows in the World in the World Trade Center because he worked at Canada Fitzgerald. Wow. Um, Before we got married, he had moved on to another company and worked in Midtown when 9-11 happened, but he at the time worked there. So our first drink was actually at Windows in the World, which is so wild. Once we kind of met, it was like these long phone calls every day and I would go back to LA. We kind of had this system where we dated by Coastly for three years and he finally forced me to move to New York. He wouldn't propose until I moved. I was like, I'm not not moving unless you get me a ring. And he's like, well, I'm not proposing to you unless you move here. (laughs) Wow. So I had to bite the bullet and move to New York, which is the best decision I ever made. You know, we, we always like, it was like, okay, well, when our kids turn 10 or whatever it is, we're moving back to California. I mean, that will never happen, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And as we were saying, your son Shane just turned 17. So that, I mean, that plan. He's so crazy. He's taller than me. It's insane. <laughs> but so it's wonderful to see you talk about him. I wanted to ask you, What qualities attracted you to him? You know, I say this all the time, you know, he makes me laugh and he's the nicest guy. Mm. Like he made me laugh probably three times this morning before I even got on this podcast. Like he's just one of those people that he finds lightness and comedy in everything. And that's very hard to come by. 
he's, he's my best friend. He's amazing. He's, he, I could not imagine life without him. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is not easy to work with him. Well, I was about to come to that actually. <laughs> no. no. And most days it's really hard. Like it, what's so funny is that, you know, we'll have like certain moments like during the day where we're kind of a couple and then it's like, we're business partners and it's like mm, all day. And then it's like, we'll have like an hour where we're lighthearted and then it's business again. And it's funny how we always said we would never bring it home. And then the pandemic happened and it's home all the time. And we actually still, so he works from home now because we have too many employees for our current office. We're waiting to open our, our New York new flagship store, hopefully at the end of May, but we're working on construction right now another stressful thing. And then we're going to move our offices off of Fifth Avenue and have larger corporate offices for everyone. So right now he works from home. So he's here all the time. And I have a schedule all sort of go in and out. I'm in the office much more than he is for design and for other things. But it's just, it's funny how the day ebbs and flows where it's like, we are like kind of not, we are not a romantic couple for most hours of the day. And then you have to kind of figure out how to turn it on and off. It's, it's, Uh very interesting dynamic. It's not easy. Sure. No, but I think you understood the the dynamics of it. You have to turn it on and off in order to be able to, you need to see the difference, right? In their relation. Hard. And it's hard to turn it on and it's hard to turn it off. It's, 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 uh, it, we deal with it every day. The more stress that comes with the business, obviously it makes it harder too. It's interesting, but I, there's no one I'd rather do it with. Right. Well, I was about to ask you, so when did you decide together that it was going to be the right thing for him to join the business? He joined the business now, how many years ago? Six years ago. And it was always this thing where he he wasn't going to really stay. It was sort of like, okay, he's going to, he'll just come in and help and get things organized. And then he just never left and we don't want him to. So he's an integral part of the company. His role will change too, as we bring other people in. So it'll be interesting to see as we continue to grow and things do change, we make more of these hires, what his role will end up being exactly, but he's not going anywhere. Mm. He does all the things that I'm not good at. It's amazing. (laughs) Fantastic. That's a true partner. It really is, which is most things. So, (laughs) you know, I'm the, I'm the creative and the design, but he does all operations and finance and everything that I can't do. Well, listen, I am in awe of what you have accomplished together and especially hearing about how you were able to continue to work and support and keep all of your team busy during this time. That's, that's incredible. So hats off to both of you. That's really inspiring. I'd love to ask you one more question about, about Kevin. Can you tell us about the Kevin in the coffee, which I I want to name it in the podcast because (laughs) because I'm going to put links in the show notes so people can discover the story of Kevin and the coffee. It literally was one of those things. It was like the avocado toast with the salt. It was one of those things where I have, because I have the Jennifer Fisher kitchen account and that account is much more personal and it shows, you know, much more of like my day-to-day of being a mom and being a wife and my life outside of Jennifer Fisher jewelry. And just one day I was lying in bed and he's like, he, he just walked in with my coffee and he saw that I was filming him and he was like, coffee? And it was like, it was like people freaked out. It was... <laughs> <laughs> He has a meme, like, or he has like a little, or I mean, he has a little gif. If you he has a gif. Fisher, yeah, you can see Kevin Fisher bringing the coffee. He like comes up it's so funny. <laughs> and it took off. And then if, if he doesn't do it, people are like, where's Kevin? <laughs> and he has like, he has like women fans that stop him on the street and are like, Kevin. Oh and my God. That's amazing. For coffee. So funny. Yeah, he, that's, that's he likes really it. Fun. Yeah. But he's, he's also that guy. Like I'm not forcing him to do it. It's just sort of like part of who we are as a couple. You know, it's just, you know, I cook the food. He brings me the coffee. Yeah. Although he's cooking a lot more too, which is really impressive. Like what's so funny is Drew wants his waffles now in the morning instead of mine, because I've been in LA for so long working that he's mastered the waffles better than me, I guess. Ooh, competition mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Totally. That's an interesting show. <laughs> Let me know when it's on. Right. <laughs> awesome. So, so um, we're almost coming to the closing questions. And before I, before I ask you about those, I wanted to ask, is there anything else that you'd like to share and, or tell our listeners that we haven't covered in today's interview? I don't know. I feel like we've talked about a lot. Yeah. We're we're chatty people. So we do have something very exciting that's happening in a few weeks. We're having a party in LA, which is so exciting too, because it's like our first opportunity because we didn't get to do 
uh, store opening for LA because it was still COVID. Like it was, we literally opened it. It was like the first people were coming into our store were wearing masks and their first time out of their homes. So all through COVID, we worked on creating a scent, a fragrance, because my whole life I've always worn a version of vanilla that I could never really get right. Same kind of thing with the salt and the jewelry. So I would combine certain scents to make my scent. And it was one of those things where everyone's always like, who smells like a cookie or who, you know, but it was never like something that was like too coyingly, like too, too, too sweet. Or I like to say that my scent that we're launching, I'm so excited about it. It's sort of like, it's, it's got hints of coconut in it. So it's almost like a cookie on vacation. <laughs> Oh my God, you sold it to me. A cookie on vacation. But it's not too sweet of a cookie. It's just, I have it on right now. It's, I'm very excited because it's warm and it's musky and it's sexy, but it's also, it's just one of those things that you're going to want to wear daily because it makes you just feel yummy. Mm. Yeah. Oh so God, wait. I I'm wait. very excited about that. We did that on our own. We did not license it. We worked hard um, to do it. It's coming out in limited edition uh, on April 19th. So we're very excited about that. That's incredible. But also, hold on a second. You didn't partner with anyone. You did it on your own. How did you do that in the middle of a pandemic? How else do we do everything on ah! our own? Man? We figure it out. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So we did it on our own. But I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, as a brand that's going into lifestyle now and the world outside of jewelry, which is really where I want to be, to be honest, I love my jewelry brand and it will always be who I am and what I do. But I do love having these tentacles of other things. It really makes me feel more rounded as a designer and as a human. So, you know, to sort of figure it out on our own and just test it to see how it goes, I think just gives us more fuel for when we are ready to, you know, license and do other mm. things, uh, you know, and other partnerships and things that are, that are coming down the pipeline. So that's all really exciting stuff. Yeah, it's, it's amazing because it sounds like you're experimenting and just finding your footing before committing. Right, because if this, were, <laughs> if this one works, you know, I've, which I think it's going to, I know it's going to, um, because I just, no, it will. We have opportunities to then do other versions of it. Mm. And also not other scents, but also other forms of the scent in terms of home fragrance, candles and things like that. Mm. So that's exciting. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I was thinking body oil, obviously, because if it's right? cookie on a holiday... I know, that, right? That's where my head's going to. sunscreen too. I mean, there's so many different things that I'm thinking that I want to do with it. So it's exciting. You know, that reminds me, there was one other thing that I heard you say in in one of the interviews, it probably was the Katie Couric one as well. Or was it Glamour? You said, we don't need to be defined by what people have done in the past. And exactly. so I feel like you've broken, you've gotten rid of the rule book and you're doing whatever you feel is right. Is that? Tell exactly. Me I think more people have to live their life that way, especially business owners and entrepreneurs. I think that, you know, we're told by so many people who are old school, who are, oh, well, you know, I, so many people say to me, well, what are you making shoes and handbags? And I'm like, never. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> Why? Because someone else did that in the past and probably failed as a jewelry designer doing that. Why do I have to be defined by what other people have done and most likely failed at too? I think it has to be, you know, naturally organic. And I hate using this word authentic to who you are as a person as to what you want to be doing, mm. you know, daily. Um, and this is just where it's taken me because this is where my passions are. You know, mm. I, none of us are going to do the same things. And for others to try to define that is crazy because they're not in my head. They're not me. Mm. So why am I going to listen to your opinion of what I should be doing? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Where did that sense of freedom come from? I think it's from learning. You know, we make so many mistakes as an entrepreneur and as a business owner and just in life as being humans. And we take bad advice and we listen to the powers that be. I mean, if I listen to what some of the most powerful people in fashion told me I should be doing, I would not have a company right now. Wow. Mm. So I think it's really, it's, it's learning to um, take people's opinions for what they are. It's their opinion. And you can listen to that. And if any of that resonates with you, you can follow through with that in your version of it. But I think for you to feel that you have to take a roadmap from someone who hasn't been down your road of what you're doing as a business owner is ridiculous. Mm. That's a why, would I listen, why would I listen to someone who is an EIC or a whatever who's telling me that I have to do this with my business because they've never been there before and they're not in my shoes? 
Yeah, that resonates. That resonates with me a lot. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're so now I'm going to ask you a few of my favorite questions ever. And uh, I can't wait to hear the answers. <laughs> so the first one is, what is a favorite word, one that you could tattoo on yourself? This is my word that I have used for, forever as a jewelry designer. It was one of the first words that I put on a brass cuff. It said fighter because I'm a fighter, because I feel like I, I'm so tough. I've gone through so many interesting things that I've always sort of fought my way through things. I don't know, that word has always resonated with me. And what's interesting is it resonates with a lot of people, but it's not a word that's really used that often, that's which is true. interesting because it's not about violence or anything like that. It's about being in inner strength. Yeah, your uh, inner warrior. My inner warrior is my fighter. It's my fighting strength. That's, warrior is a great word too, but I wouldn't put that on my body. Awesome. I would love to know what song best represents you. Oh God. It was That's so funny. A hard I, one. <laughs> so I was talking, so I, I went through your questions this morning and I was talking to Kevin and Shane and was it, was it Kevin or Shane? One of them was like, it's the Rihanna song, bitch better have my money. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I was like, Yes. No, I mean, it, it's, it's actually kind of true because we, <laughs> because we also have this, this is really funny in the back of my office, a friend of mine who is also an entrepreneur gave me a little piece of art and it says, fuck you, pay me. <laughs> and it's sort of those, it, it is, it's all, it's all tongue in cheek and funny, but it is, you know, as an entrepreneur, those are all things that we, we live by. Yeah. No, we can't Very. say that. We can't say it that way publicly, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> I side with you on that. Amazing. Yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Mm. Yeah. What is a secret superpower that you have? You know, what is my secret superpower? I I think it's this weird. I don't want this to come off the the wrong way. But I, it's sort of my weird ability to sort of guess things that other people might need. And Kevin would say it's like your eye, but it's not. I don't know. I think it's uh, maybe it's my ability to to be strong enough and saying like, OK, well, maybe we need to do this. Maybe, you know, let's do this and having having the courage to do it. I don't know. That doesn't really sound right. Maybe it's my I mean, it's my boundless energy. I don't know. I was about to ask you about your boundless energy. <laughs> it's weird. It's my whole life. I've been like this. Hmm. I mean, it's not very secret, but it's secret, not a whether, secret where it comes from. It's not a secret. I don't know. That's, a tough, that's kind of a tough one for me. What is my secret superpower? I don't know. That's okay. We can let it be. Yeah. What is a favorite book that you can share with us? Well, so I'm not much of a deep reader, as you might be able to guess, but I, I wish I was. I wish that was something that I could actually focus on because I have a very hard time with my attention, staying and reading. But when it is, and I'm going to say, and I mentioned it earlier in my favorite book, because it did completely change my life, mm. is that is Ketotarian by Will Cole, because that book, the health learning thing, it, it really, it changed my life. Mm. I'm not bowing to that doctor as being the end all be all doctor, but I, I do believe that what he taught me and others in that book is something that's really, really important to people that have autoimmune disorders. And in my fifties, you know, for something to be that life changing for me, that's my favorite book. Yeah. Where is somewhere? What is the last lie you told? I, I, it was like a reason I couldn't go to some like work event or something. <laughs> we all have done many, many times. I think I just did it the other day. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry, I can't go. I got, I, got, I got something. Is there an embarrassing moment in your life that you could share with us? <sighs> I mean... I don't, you know, there's lots of embarrassing things. It probably has to do with like, you know, like I, I've done so many embarrassing things and I can't even tell you. And some of them are <laughs> embarrassing for different reasons, but I don't really have one that's, I mean, it would be like passing gas in the middle of a very big fashion or something. Like like that. That's but very like, funny. I have really no. all done that. So yeah. like, I don't know, you know, what's, what is it? So now, um, Imagining that you can step into a future version of yourself, what most important advice do you think that this future self can give you in your present state? In my present state, it would tell me to breathe more often, 
I think to enjoy, you know, as an entrepreneur and as someone building your business, you know, we're always looking like 10 steps ahead of like what, what we want to be or where we want to go. I think that to, to, to enjoy the moment of where I am today more mm. and to, you know, look around. And I say this all the time, but every day is a gift, but in that gift, recognizing more of, you know, every day is going to be different and it's never going to be the same as today. So appreciating more of what happens each day as we grow and these milestones that we hit and appreciating them more because we're so in it and you're so consumed in your bubble of like, you know, I I just opened a store in Beverly Hills. Like that's a big deal to a jewelry designer. I know I'm about to open a store in Soho. That's a big deal, but you're so caught up in everything that goes into actually doing it. You're not enjoying the moment of it as much. So that's what I need to focus on more. And I, that's probably what I would tell myself, you know, to enjoy more of it, the day-to-day of all of it. Cause it's exciting. Yeah. And you're so you're looking at it as the stress of it instead of what, how exciting it is. Mm. So trying to sort of slow down a little bit and appreciate what you have and what's going on a little bit more every day, instead of being so focused on what's next. Yeah. Be more present. Totally. Which I need to work on every day. <laughs> so my last question is also my favorite. So Jennifer, can you please tell me what brings you happiness? I mean, I, it's, it's my family and being alive every day to be with my family. It's the ability to, to be alive and to be here every day doing what I am so lucky to be able to do and to be surrounded by the people that I am surrounded by daily and most importantly, my family and my husband. Thank you so dog. much. Oh, yeah. Don't forget the dog. That's really wonderful. Thank you so much for all of your time and your answers and your energy. And it was an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to to have this in-depth conversation and to share it. I hope that many people will, will resonate and be excited and fascinated to find out more about you and your journey and your fantastic cooking skills and and all of your upcoming attractions. Thank you so much for having me. I missed you so much. (laughs) Me too. I will come to New York. Please come to New York. More easy. easy. Let's meet in Europe. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. All right. Come whenever you want. Um, So I will put all of the links in the show notes so people can find you, the multiple Instagrams and and the website and everything. So thanks again for um, being my guest on the show. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. You too. uh, And hopefully- It's so good. It's so good to see your- (laughs) You're so (laughs) welcome. And uh, let's catch up again very, very soon. I would love that. Awesome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks again to Jennifer Fisher for being my guest on the show today. You can find her online at Jennifer Fisher Jewelry, on Instagram at Jennifer Fisher Kitchen, and all of the other links will also be added to the show notes. So friends and listeners, thanks again for joining today. If you'd like to hear more, you can subscribe to the show on any podcast platform that you enjoy listening to. If you'd like to connect with me, you can get in touch at Anne V on Twitter, on LinkedIn, Anne Mulataller, and at underscore out of the clouds on Instagram, where I also share some guided meditations and other daily musings, generally about mindfulness and, of course, occasionally about the podcast. You can find all of the episodes and more as well on AnneVMulataller.com. If you don't know how to spell it, that's okay. It's also in the links and the show notes. Please subscribe if you'd like to receive my monthly newsletter. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening to Out of the Clouds. I hope you'll join me again next time. Until then, be well, be safe, and take care.